for authors, those who write about what it means to be union, and union members who write. A new report from the Economic Policy Institute and Labor History. Activate Live starts now. Get involved. Get involved. Take We're union and we're proud. Welcome to Activate Live. I'm Tanya Hutchins coming to you from Machinist Union headquarters in Upper Marlboro, Maryland. We'll get to our authors in just a moment. But first, a report out today from the Economic Policy Institute finds that more than 40% of employers were charged with violating federal law in union election campaigns. It states that current law fails to provide enough penalties. The report also found that U.S. employers are charged with illegally firing workers in more than 20% of all union election campaigns in 2016 and 2017. In addition, EPI's report finds U.S. employers are charged with illegally threatening, coercing or retaliating against workers in nearly 30 percent of union election campaigns. And employers spent more than $330 million on hiring anti-union lawyers and consultants, and that number could be even higher. For more information or to see the full report, go to epi.org. Well, December 10th was International Human Rights Day. The United Nations says international days are occasions to educate the public on issues of concern, to mobilize political will and resources to address global problems, and to celebrate and reinforce achievements of humanity. The existence of international days predates the establishment of the United Nations, but the UN has embraced them as a powerful advocacy tool. Article 23 of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights was proclaimed and adopted in 1948 and addresses the rights and freedoms of which every human being is equally entitled. On page 48, you'll find workers' rights. The first one, everyone has the right to work, to free choice of employment, to just and favorable conditions of work and to protection against unemployment. Number two, everyone without any discrimination has the right to equal pay for equal work. Everyone who works has the right to just and favorable remuneration, ensuring for himself and his family an existence worthy of human dignity and supplemented if necessary by other means of social protection. And four, everyone has the right to form and to join trade unions for the protection of his interests. The entire document is 63 pages long with illustrations and is available online. Well, IAM Local 2016 in Florida received a big thank you from the Brevard Family Partnership for sponsoring 400 children this year. The local has been working with the organization for the past 12 years, raising funds through events and raffles. Members buy toys and clothes for the Brevard County Children in Crisis. True service to the community by our members at Kennedy Space Center in our Southern Territory. And we'd like to give a shout out to this week's IAM Advanced Communicators class at the William W. Wimpesinger Education and Technology Center in Hollywood, Maryland. IAM Communications Representative Andy Hounschel is teaching that class. Yesterday, Velana Cochran and I taught them about mobile video and video messaging. All of those students had taken basic communicators and they're doing a great job with communications for their locals. Well, mainstream schools rarely teach children about labor unions, so it's often up to parents and members to educate young people these days about our work, our rights, and our movement. Well, joining us now is author and veteran union attorney, Mark Torres, who has a great children's book, so great that I gave it to my nieces. Welcome, Mark. Thanks for being here. Thanks for having me, Tanya. Now, the book that I'm talking about, Good Guy Jake, is a children's book. How did you come up with the idea for this book? Well, initially, I was I was uh, approached by a publisher, Tim Sheard, uh, from Hardball Press, and he asked me to work on the story and conceive it and, and eventually author it. And uh, it's, it's a wonderful children's story. It teaches unions what we do. It teaches children what we do at a young age. It's uh, beautifully illustrated, bilingual, and most important, it sends a positive message for labor through telling of an enchanting story. 
Um, the book is centered on Jake, who is a sanitation worker and a union union employee. And uh, he goes about his route, uh, picking up old trash from, from the curb and, and stuff that's discarded, like broken toys. He would bring them home, fix them up, and then donate them to a local children's shelter. Unfortunately, the city rule is when trash is put to the curb, no employees are allowed to take it. So one day an angry motorist sees him do this, reports him, and he gets fired from his job. Luckily, he's part of a union. He, he files a grievance, and it takes the matter to arbitration in an effort to get his job back. Uh, it's an important message, um, obviously taught, aimed at teaching young children the story. Uh, in this case, uh, I, read, I read the book to my daughter's fifth grade class. And at the end of the reading, I asked, I asked them all if, if Jake would have gotten his job back if he wasn't part of the union. And they all said no. So they realized that Jake's uh, being a union member was critical for that and that, that it resonated with them at such a young age was quite important. Now, you already gave us some feedback from that class. What other feedback have you received about the book? Oh, positive. You know, initially it, it was aimed at, at, you know, educational. Uh, and a lot of the unions out there market their educational pamphlets are quite stale, quite regular. We want to do something different, something unique, something that tells. And we've gotten a lot of positive feedback from different unions uh, at local and international levels, as well as the members. And most importantly, their family. They could, uh, a business agent, a representative can go home and, and read this book with his child and, and tell them this is what we do and what we can do. And, and they, they get a, a clear understanding of that instead of just hearing, oh, my mom and dad work at a union. This seems like a great book to get into school libraries because it was the first one that I had seen that really talked about unions with kids. Yes, of course, getting into a lot of the libraries in Queens and Nassau County have it. Uh, it was a school of the a book of the month in my daughter's school which is important, a great feat there where all the classes were reading it. And it's just a great way to get out the positive message. And you know, when, when I give these talks, I, I explain to them that it, there's many types of union workers from the teachers in their classroom to of course, firemen, policemen, manufacturers, warehousemen, you know, all walks of life and different careers. And the importance of being in a union is, is centered in that. Now I'm glad to see that it's bilingual. Explain just the setup of, of where the English and the Spanish is on the book. Sure. Uh, and, uh, on each, each page is illustrated. And on the other side of the page, it will have on the top paragraph in English and on the bottom paragraph in Spanish. And again, it, it helps you know be more welcoming to our, our Latino populated uh, unions as well as in English. And it's just a great way to make everyone feel included in the story as well and, they should be. And it's also educational in the fact that you have both languages on each page that it will help kids with both languages. <laughs> Absolutely. We'd hope, we'd hope to encourage that, the, 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 their learnings as well. Now, you have two other books as well. Um, what are those about? Yes. Well, as a lawyer, I write for a living. Uh, I love legal writing, but I also wanted to have an outlet from that. So I've authored two murder mystery cold, uh, cold case books. The first one in 2015 is called The Stirring in the North Fork. And the second one, the, 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 the sequel, is called Adeline. Uh, the interesting thing about Adeline is that my 11-year-old daughter had created the art cover for this book. Nice. And it was important to, her, to involve her in the business, so to speak, and uh, and get her involved in understanding it. Uh, again, it's just a break from my legal writing. It's it's great, entertaining stories, murder mysteries, uh, the genre that I typically love to to read and watch as programs. And it was great as, as a union attorney to put my experiences into these writings. Do you have the same character in both The Stirring in the North Fork and Adeline? Yes, Savoy Graves is the the uh, admittedly somewhat self autobiographical. He's in a, he's a, an attorney uh, turned slash detective, and he starts off in this first case where he's lost his job at a law firm. He's looking for something to do. He embarks on this this journey to find out the origins of this unsolved murder for forty years. Uh, he he of course carries over to the second book, Adeline. Uh, however, although they're sequels, there are standalone books, so you wouldn't have to have read one to know the other, but Savoy Graves is the main character that continues on through both books. Uh, he's this lovable character, this average Joe who just cares enough uh, to, to investigate these cases that no one else would, would or did. So Mark, where can readers find your books, especially Good Guy Jake? Yes, Good Guy Jake is available at Hardball Press as well as Amazon. And both my books, Stirring in the North Fork and Adeline, are also available on Amazon. And uh, they're widely available. You can also follow me on Twitter at uh, mtorresauthor1, as well as Instagram and Facebook. Okay, we'll put the links in the comments of the show later on. If you have an, an event coming up, I'll let you go ahead and plug it. 
I do have one in local Floral Park Historical Society in February uh, that, you know, a lot of these things fi fi uh, uh, finalizing as well as other libraries throughout Nassau County. And uh, those are still in the works. Thank you so much, Mark. We appreciate it. Um, thank you for having labor or working themes in your books. Um, I think it will really educate a lot of people. My pleasure. And thanks for having me. Have a wonderful holiday season and Union Strong. Union Strong. Thanks. Well, join the conversation right here on this video post. Let us know what you think about the children's book, Good Guy Jake, and why we should have more educational books that teach about unions. Well, our next guest is a familiar face to the Machinist Union because he's an education representative at our training center, the William W. Wimpesinger Education and Technology Center here in Maryland. Now, Edmundo Osorio wrote this book called Dearly Deported, and he's here now to tell us all about it. Thanks for being here. Thank you, Tanya. It's good to be here. It's good to be uh, in the guest chair. <laughs> As Edmundo opposed. hosts our Spanish version, Activité Latino, so um, you've probably seen him do that as well. So before we get to the book itself, tell us a little bit about you and when you first learned about unions. I first learned about unions. I think uh, I've always known about unions, but I really got more involved with unions through my, my brother Steve. Uh, my brother Steve has a design studio in L.A. 80 p.m., and he was working as a union uh, chief steward uh, shop uh, committee for the UAW in California for the Chrysler Design Center, uh, Chrysler Pacifica. And uh, as a chief steward, and he had to come up with a lot of resolutions and proposals for, for safety, for tooling. And so we did a lot of, of, a lot of brainstorming, him and I, for, for several years. And I got to see uh, the, the dynamics of, of being in a union as opposed to an at-will employee, which I was for many years. And I really got excited uh, working with my brother. Uh, I, I kind of swore to myself that would be the next job I would get. I was, I've always worked in aerospace, and uh, that's what, how I landed at Pratt & Whitney was through a union job with, fortunately, the best union in the world, the Machinist Union. So. All right. We're glad to have you. What was it when you were working with your, your brother when something clicked? Like, what was that feeling? Well, the feeling that, wow, such liberty, the, uh, the, the, the feeling of being able to demand uh, recognition for whether, again, safety or tooling or processes to do your job, as opposed to waiting on the supervisor or the manager to, uh, on their whim, whether they want to give it to you or not. I saw the power, the collective, the collective power that unions wield. And we're going to get historical just for a moment because your dad was, one, was in one of the first worker programs. Um, tell us a little bit about your dad, who's about to celebrate a very special birthday, and, and the worker program that he was in when he was about 20. Yeah, the, my father, Luis Osorio, uh, he lives in San Diego, and he was actually one of the original braceros. Uh, when he was 20 years old, just young and wide-eyed, adventuresome, signed up for one of the first programs during World War II, uh, there was a, a lack of work, workers. Most of the men had gone, many of the folks had gone out to war, and they needed folks out doing a lot of the hard labor, uh, picking fruit, picking cotton, picking, uh, you know, doing all the tough agricultural work. So what he did is he went, he, you know, he tells the story, my dad's gonna turn 97 years old next year, God willing. That's amazing. And uh, it just, he's still sharp as a tack, and I always tell people, he still has all of his teeth and not in a jar. Right? <laughs> and, and so he said he went to, uh, to the state capitol, which is uh, Hermosillo, Sonora, and uh, they signed up and paperwork and the fingerprinting and all the stuff they do. And he tells the story about getting in the, in the, in the bus with all the different uh, countrymen from all over, the, the, all over Mexico, the, the capital mm -hmm. from every state. And uh, one of the interesting things he remembers, and he kind of looks off in the horizon when he remembers uh, of crossing into, into the gallus and having to do the quarantine of the medical. They did the chemical baths and the de-lousing. He just said, he was ready to turn around at that point. It was mm -hmm. so hard. And, and, and it taught me a lot because, you know, when you talk to my father about the discrimination he, 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 he faced, uh, you know, even though they were coming to do work, he wasn't getting paid very much. Mm -hmm. It was a, a, a very small amount of money. 
and the uh, the folks didn't treat them too well. You know, even 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 within the ranks, because you know the governments, the bosses, they had a way of pitting people against each other. Mm -hmm. And so he said he, he worked. He kind of kept to himself. He worked hard. He loved the adventure. Uh, he was able to come for a couple of years and work, uh, save a little bit of money, return back to Mexico. And uh, but he he loved. He couldn't leave it alone. He loved the adventure. He loved this country. He loved everything and the progress, and he wanted his children to eventually come one day. And he passes that a lot, that, that, that energy and that, that freedom al al uh, along to all of us, my brothers and sisters. So it's a uh, you know, very creative family that we come from, uh, writers and poets and musicians. And so uh, my brother, you know, sculptors. Uh, that's what my, my younger brother does as well, mm -hmm. my older brother as well. And you're artistic. I see you. I do a lot of drawing, drawing and writing and poetry. And, and so it's, I, I guess, it's, you know, it's in the blood. Mm -hmm. And I, I speak about that in my book because I think it comes from uh, the, uh, the Aztec blood, the, the Mexica tribe. Uh, you know, we're very crafty, you know, we, you know, craftsmen, and we like to build, we like to draw, we like to, you know, create. And it's, it's, in, it's, it's in the DNA. Well, you mentioned your book and your writing. Tell us about Dearly Deported. What is Dearly the synopsis? The, the book. So the synopsis uh, story of uh, <clears throat> basically seven uh, undocumented migrants that are being deported mm -hmm. back to uh, their home country, which is in uh, Mexico. They are from various countries. However, uh, a lot of workers, what they do is they claim to be from Mexico. So when they're deported, they can be deported right back. To Mexico and they can cross again. The, uh, and you said that's pretty common. It, it's a pretty common thing uh, to talk to someone from uh, Central America or even you know m you know a lot more south than that to claim to be from Mexico because they speak Spanish, and that way in case they're deported, they're deported right to a, a, a border town in Mexico, and it makes it easier so they don't have to cross three or four borders all over again to, to return. I think this gives us a glimpse into a life that many of our viewers may not know about or may not have seen. You have many characters in this book, and even though they may not be union members, we're always looking at that difference between the benefits of being in a union and non-union workers and working conditions. Let's take a character, for instance, like Doña Rosa. You said she's a contracted housekeeper. What is her life like working? So Doña Rosa is an interesting character because she's kind of an amalgamation of several characters. But the one character that I basically uh, based her on was one of the one of the the cleaning staff at Pratt and Whitney, where I worked at a big aerospace company. You know, we make turbine engines. Some of those turbine engines are for military use. So we all workers there have to be vetted and we have to go through e-verify, but. The contract cleaners didn't have to. And so speaking with her uh, constantly all the time, uh, you know, me, here I am, a union member. Here I am with my, my, my world-class health benefits, my defined pensions. And on the contrast, here she is, uh, barely making minimum wage. She's, you know, she's telling me, I, I hope during the Christmas time, I, I hope that my boss can, can pay us this Friday. Uh, she's, she doesn't have the paperwork, uh, whatever her paperwork she has, she's, that's, Doña Rosa wasn't her real name. She had another name that I, I knew her from. But that's, that's kind of like the unscrupulous thing that a lot of these contractors do. And here's a person that, uh, it, you know, bless her soul, uh, worked so hard and she didn't... Didn't know when her paycheck yeah, was coming. Didn't, have her, her, didn't know where her paycheck was, but she had access to highly sensitive classified blueprints and documents throughout the whole plant. Wow. It was amazing. You know, she, you know, the people and engineers would be working on a project and she'd be emptying out trash cans and cleaning uh, areas in the, in, the, in the plant at Pratt & Whitney. And, you know, we work with a lot of uh, military products, you know, and uh, wow. it was amazing the contrast, the, the, the fact that here are these workers that are an integral part of this, this country. They really are. And, and so I feel like this story had to be told. Yeah. And, and their conditions are different. I their, mean, their to conditions. not know when your paycheck is coming, oh, or if it's coming. That is the reason I wrote this book. You know, I, I, I have a home in, in Tijuana, Mexico, and my kids were teenagers when we moved down there to that home. And so all of a sudden, I start seeing all these English speakers that are friends of theirs. And so we talked, and next thing you know, they're telling me, well, these, these guys was deported, or she was deported. 
And so, you know, I love storytelling. My father is very good at telling me, you know, history of what, you know, what he remembers. And so it, he passes that on to me. And so I love listening to their stories. And they recounted all these stories that I, that I talk about in the book. And, you know, I wonder... And this is a novel. Let's remind yeah, people. Yeah, it's, it's a novel. A novel. And, and I, but I took the characters and I, and I did artistic interpretation, artistic freedom to create these characters and put all of them together in the back of one van. And so they're, they're infighting and they're, they're, you know, hating each other, loving each other. They're crying, they're laughing, and they're, they're tell, I'm telling the story from their point of view because I don't think that story is, is being told right. And if it is, it's being told only in Spanish. And so we understand that, that culture, but I don't think the English-speaking world really understands or values that, that culture. These, these kids, a lot of these kids that made friends with my son, <coughs> <clears throat> my sons, they were brought to the U.S. as, as children. Mm -hmm. And so this is the only country they've ever, they've ever known. They consider this home. This, this is, is home. their home. They, they have no idea what to expect in Mexico. A lot of them don't even speak Spanish. Mm -hmm. So when they get deported, mm -hmm. they're scared. They don't know that country. It's, 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 it's foreign to them. And so, so uh, they get to a place where they don't know anybody, may not speak the language. I mean, I can see where a lot of people end up homeless that way. Absolutely. Uh, a lot of them come right back. Some of them assimilate into the, the society there, but a lot of them wind up going into work for cartels and a lot of nefarious activity that they wind up doing. So mm -hmm. it was just amazing to me uh, to get this, you know, first-hand accounts and the stories that they told that were just fascinating to me. I, I had to write them down. And this is just a small portion of the stories that mm -hmm. were told to me. And Luis I had to, is another one, right? Luis uh, is another character. He's a trainer of horses. He's a character that uh, was discriminated against in his own country because he's a gay. He's a gay mm -hmm. character. And, uh, you know, he's, he's the most tragic but uh, the most inspiring character. I mean, I don't want to ruin the plot. Don't give the it plot, away. Yeah, yeah. But uh, he really is, out of all the characters, he's the one I admire the most. And when I wrote this book, sometimes I was laughing. Sometimes I was crying. You know, it depending on where I'm at. So it's, it, you know, weaves a story, you know, of, of, of this, of what's going on in, in this country, what's, what went on. And then I also am able to tell the story of the Aztec uh, rising, uh, Aztlan and, and the Mexica tribe. So I, I weave that within the story as well. So it's really kind of like, a, you know, I like to think of it kind of like the inspired by the, the kind of Monte Cristo where you have story mm -hmm. within story within story. Mm -hmm. And so uh, there's all kinds of stories coming together and, and for one point. And uh, there's just a lot of different levels. I was very inspired. I thank God for allowing me to, you know, write this. Uh, very inspired and uh, inspired by my father, inspired by my union because I was so... I was just amazed at the difference between my employment and these, these kids, these young folks that were coming into Mexico, deported without papers. They were just hardworking folks, uh, grew up in this country. The stories they were telling here, I was, you know, first world country mentality and uh, uh, spoiled, you know, complaining about, you know, certain things uh, like we all do. Mm -hmm. But it really helped me appreciate uh, and turn around so that I could, uh, you know, give more to my union. I, I, at this point, after writing the book, I, I think I really went all out and started uh, uh, putting my efforts into unionism. I started uh, working with the Spanish Leadership Working Group. I started working with the W3 Center. Uh, and that following year, I actually was offered the position as education rep. Uh, so it, it really opened my eyes, the experience, the writing. I didn't know it was going to be so much detail into to writing it. It was just so much. So. And you were saying that this is just a sliver, like this is just a little part of what you visualized. It, yes, it's just a small fraction a sliver. I constantly, when I look in the news and I see what's going on with the deportations and the dreamers and the kids in the cages, you know, all those stories, I, I heard them from these, these folks and their parents and their uncles. And these are stories that if you know if you're if you're in that culture and you talk to these folks that are undocumented, they're, they'll tell you they'll be more than happy to tell you their experiences and they are amazing. But most of the time, even us who are you know English speakers, we're shielded from all of that. But when we go into you know one of their homes and talk to them, you know we we're humbled. 
we're humbled to, to really experience what, to feel what they're, they're having to, to live on a daily basis. Hiding, hiding in the cracks, trying to, to survive, not knowing if this is their last day. I know a lot of you members consider immigration an economic issue because we have neighbors, we have friends, we have co-workers, um, and you know, immigrants built this country, but I think we don't realize the impact uh, that immigrants have economically oh, on yeah. this country, and I think to take them all away would, would have an economic impact. No, I, I, I think that that's thinking uh, negatively, you mm -hmm. know, if, if we're going to progress, we really, and I know a lot of folks don't like the word diversification, mm -hmm. but diversification is not a new word. This is mm -hmm. what the country is made of, of a diverse languages, peoples, mm -hmm. cultures, and that's what makes this country how it is. Every country likes to mimic this country uh, because of our diversification. So it's, it's nothing new. It's not going anywhere but it's only going to become stronger. And I think we have to celebrate that as opposed to trying to get rid of it. Tell us a little bit about um, your role in LACLA. It's, uh, tell us a little bit about LACLA and, and you are in the Washington, D.C. chapter, correct? Yes, I was you know, just elected a president of the D.C. chapter of LACLA. So uh, all my LACLA brothers and sisters out there. And that's Labor Council for the Latin Lab American yes, Advancement, the right? Labor Council for Latin American Advancement. And it, we work with a lot of uh, Central Americans, a lot of uh, Latino groups, and we work with immigrants and, and, and dreamers, uh, trying to educate them, educate them in the politics, educate them on the community, the ways we do uh, things in the, in the United States, uh, having programs like Get Out the Vote. And, you know, most of it, what we do is educational, just to, you know, make members aware, uh, make people aware, make the community aware of the strength of Latino movement. Uh, it's, always, it's always been here, and it's uh, hopefully only going to get stronger. Mm -hmm. And we are able to, you know, contribute so much to this community because of uh, our, our belief of working hard. But again, LACLA is there to provide a lot of education and training. Uh, get out the vote. A lot of these get out the vote campaigns. Get people out there registered. Get them mm -hmm. to vote. Get them involved in, in uh, civic, your civic duties, civic engagement. And so uh, when you see these LACLA placards out uh, uh, to, to do some training, uh, you know, even shop steward training. We'll do some shop steward training because we... We're, we're out there with all the, the groups, you know, SEIU, and we're mm -hmm. working with uh, La Una mm -hmm. and with the UFCW. Obviously, the I, IAM is a, one of the big uh, part of, of LACLA. And so uh, we, we, we work, you know, really hard to make sure that we get our name out there. And as you know, we just had our first, we, I think you had her as a guest, uh, yes. Yanira Merino, our okay. first uh, female president of LACLA. I'm just very a couple weeks ago, we excited had her on. about that. Yes. yes, and you don't have to be Latino to be in LACLA. I'm yeah. a member of LACLA, and uh, there are many union members that are in all of the AFL-CIO constituency groups. Um, so we're all working together, no matter what our background, and I'm proud to be a LACLA member. That's right. So almost time to renew next year. That's right. Sign up for LACLA, all you union members, uh, especially machinists. We expect you guys to <laughs> sign up for LACLA. It's uh, it's a great cause, and go to your meetings, attend, get involved, get active, you know, because uh, you know, I like to say, because I, I also teach uh, history, and I say to uh, a lot of the participants that come to the center that uh, labor history or the American history is really a story of labor history because workers built it. And this, this union, our union, uh, you know, we help build this, this country, and our union is comprised of some very hardworking folks very creative folks. I, I meet so many wonderful uh, shop stewards and, and members that have written books, that have, uh, write music, that are musicians, that are business owners. They come in every kind of, of uh, creative type. And uh, I get excited just you know, knowing that our union is, is filled with so many dynamic members. It's exciting. We are so glad that you stopped by. Remind people how they can get your book, Dearly Deported. Dearly Deported is available on Amazon. If you type my name into the search box, Edmundo Osorio, you will be able to get the book. And I will be giving out a couple of books for those folks who type in Dearly Deported in the comments. Ooh. I will send a couple of books out. Joe will tell me who they are. He'll randomly select and 
I will personally sign a book and mail it to you. Excellent. Thank you so much for stopping by, Edmundo. We appreciate it. And hang on. Oh, look, we have a comment here. We need to do more to protect the dreamers and help them find their way to full citizenship. I agree, John Linbo, because many of them are workers helping our economy, yeah. contributing to our economy. Now, can I say a shout out to my dad? Yes, yes, All right. do that. Apa, saludos de, de Maryland, de Washington. Uh, nos vemos, te quiero mucho, mis hermanos y mis hermanas in San Diego y Tijuana, and to my lovely, beautiful wife who just had surgery today. I'm Aww. sorry you're hurting in bed today. I love you, Maria. Well, hello to Maria. We hope you feel better and happy birthday to your dad. So no problem. And stick around because we're going to have him at the end of the show because I want him to tell us like if we're going to have more Activite Latino uh, next year. So we want you to join the conversation. What do you think? Comment now to activate your voice no matter where you're watching. You can even comment during the replay. We love to hear your thoughts about organizing, solidarity, unionism, LACLA, and as Edmundo said, if you type Dearly Deported into the comments, there's going to be a drawing for his book. So, all right. And if you need another book recommendation on this holiday season, check out a book called Beaten Down, Worked Up by longtime labor reporter Stephen Greenhouse. He retired from the New York Times but hasn't stopped writing, and this is his latest book about union busting and the challenges unions face while trying to raise labor standards. It's a very good book. Well, here's a look back at this week in labor history. On this date in 1886, a small group of black farmers organized the Colored Farmers National Alliance and Cooperative Union in Houston County, Texas, after being barred from the all-white Southern Farmers Alliance. The new union went through intensive organizing, eventually merging with another black farmers group and renamed itself the Colored Alliance by 1891 with a membership of more than one million. Well, on December 13, 1924, American Federation of Labor founder and President Samuel Gompers died in San Antonio, Texas. He is a legend in the labor movement. And on December 14, 1995, more than 30,000 machinists at Boeing ended their 69-day strike after winning pay and benefits increases and protections against overseas subcontracting. And we just want you to know that we appreciate you for watching our weekly show and spreading the word about Activate Live. We want to thank all of you for your support throughout the year. Now, Activate Live will be on hiatus until January 8th, so we won't see you until then, but Edmundo Osorio and I would like to wish you happy holidays. And Edmundo, Feliz Navidad, Feliz Navidad. Y prospero año nuevo. And will we have an Activite Latino next year? Good Lord willing, yes, we'll have Activate Latino in, in uh, March of 2020. Hopefully we'll be able to broadcast uh, from here or from uh, the W3 Center. Excellent, we look forward to it. So, As do I. happy holidays, happy everyone. Holidays. We'll see you next year. Thank you.